I thought it would be really helpful to just go through the process and how we got to where we are so that people can really understand the whys and the wherefores. So I run a clinical trial centre for rare neurodevelopmental disorders here in Brisbane. So we have a lot of clinical trials going on, ranging from ASOs and gene therapies through to cannabidiol and other symptom management um, trials. But in particular, there are two, three companies actually that we're working with that are working in CBD. So Zynerva particularly focusing on Fragile X and GW focusing on epilepsies and some autism work. Um, GW is now also known as Jazz Pharmaceuticals. So just so you're aware of all of those important things. So I've divided my talk up into um, three main areas really to give some fairly simple and straightforward takeaways. We don't ever conduct clinical trials unless there's some sort of physiological rationale or reason for it. So when we think about the cannabinoid system, we actually have an internal endocannabinoid system. And this is um, really regulated by two types of receptors, this, um, which you can see here. They occur on what we call the presynaptic um, sort of neurons, which are sort of the beginning of it. And they act as an internal sort of break. So what tends to happen is that um, these things, anandamide and 2-AG, are the little orange dots here, and they are secreted and regulated by a number of um, chemicals and things in the post-synaptic neuron, but they go back and they sort of act as a break and sort of modulate and modify the transmission of a number of neurotransmitters. So particularly those that, um, such as glutamate um, and uh, glutamate in pre predominantly, but they work in both excitatory synapses and inhibitory synapses, um, affecting how GABA is the, is, so that's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So they work in lots of different ways, but particularly in the CBD, CB1 and CB2 receptors. When we think about how that might be important for Fragile X syndrome is that we think this reduced FMRP here has an effect on the DAGL function, which is one of these regulators of 2AG, um, the anandamide um, endocannabinoids. And so what tends to happen without FMRP is that you get all this unregulated production of 2-AG and anandamide, which means the whole system sort of goes into chaos. And what tends to happen is that the CB1 receptors get ingested basically and disappear into presynaptic neurons. And then you get unregulated production of glutamate and GABA. And so the system goes completely awry. So you get reduced expression, abnormal production, desensitization, internalization of these receptors, increased glutamate, um, which impacts the MGLUR5 and altered GABA production. So that's why we think this is important in um, Fragile X. So when we think about cannabidiol as a product, it's just one of lots and lots and lots of cannabinoids that are found in the cannabis sativa plant. Um, and we think that it's the non-euphoric component. So we have THC and we have um, cannabidiol. They're all called cannabinoids. So we have the particular cannabidiol product. And it helps where there's loss of that endogenous signaling. So if we go back, um, what we see is that absolute chaos of the 2AG and the anandamide um, causing problems with the CB1 receptors. So the CBD, so cannabidiol, helps regulate that and prevents that sort of 
resumption of the CB1 receptors and increases the availability of those normal um, 2AE, 2AG and the anandamide um, products that we already make. Interestingly, it also binds to serotonin receptors and actually enhances the impact of serotonin. It's a positive modulator of the GABA-A receptors, so in that inhibitory sort of area, and it proves that balance in inhibitory and excitatory um, transmitters. And it also supports um, dopamine receptors a little bit as well. And you can see here this sort of feedback loop. So when things get out of control, you get more endocannabinoids produced and you go back into this general system that's nice and controlled. So when that's disrupted with too much um, endocannabinoid um, floating around, you get very marked dysregulation of the homeostatic um, sort of sense, if you like. So this is a, a little schedule of that. So the green dots are the CBD or the cannabidiol. So that comes along and kind of protects the CB1 receptor from all this increased dysregulated production of 2AG. And so it protects this from being resorbed. And that then provides feedback. So it controls and supports the glutamate production. And likewise here, will also control and support GABA production. So in the absence of the control by FMRP through these other modulators, CBD is thought to come in and provide some of that control. So in summary, there's a good physiological reason why CBD should be important in fragile X syndrome and a good physiological reason why people with fragile X syndrome have some challenges with their CBD, their own endogenous, so the C the cannabinoids they make themselves. So a really good reason to move forward with research. So back a few years ago now, we conducted um, a study, and this was um, sponsored by Zynerba Pharmaceuticals, which was what we call a phase one, two study. And this is where we A, test that a product is safe, and B, see if there's any sort of signs that it might make a difference to people because when people do sort of studies in animals what they're dealing with is a whole lot of mice that are exactly the same because when you breed mice up for research they're all exactly the same genetically whereas we humans might have a fragile X um, mutation but we have lots of other genes that are different as well so we're not as a homogenous population so the first thing that um, trials will often do is do a small test run if you like to see if it seems like there might be a sign that it might work and to make sure it's safe. Now that's particularly important in children because if we make a mistake in children it lasts a very long time so it's really important to make sure it's safe. So we run an open label trial where everybody gets the medication and we look for safety signals and efficacy so is it work basically. So we did a study in combination with Sydney and um, Jonathan Cohen's um, unit in Melbourne where we studied 20 patients, three quarters of whom were male, mean age of 10 years, and we looked for our primary areas of interest. The Adams is an anxiety scale, and so you have a primary area of interest and then you have a whole lot of other exploratory um, sort of things that you're investigating. So we looked at anxiety, we looked at the ABC, so irritability, um, community participation, social isolation. We looked at visual analogue scales, which are basically just a line where you put a cross where you might exist in terms of, you know, anxiety, those sorts of things. And then the global impression scale, both a caregiver and a clinician um, uh, scale. And what we found was that it seemed to have a fairly significant effect with um, these domains of the ADAM scale. So these are a few measures of the ADAM scale. So hyperactive behaviour, there was a significant difference between pre and post, not so much with depression items, social avoidance and general anxiety as a slight 
um, improvement in compulsive behaviour, but really they were the most significant things. And so there were some others that were significant in, if we broke down the ABC, social avoidance was really clearly um, significant in a pre-post measure. And stereotypies, which are those things where kids have um, repeated movements that are much the same. And for kids with fragile legs, that's often when they're a bit anxious. So it's hard to tease that out. Is that an anxiety result or is that just a movement thing? So we think it's probably anxiety result. Certainly with irritability and those visual analog styles, but it was clear that that social avoidance and the anxiety were the key measures that were really important. So that the one that the other thing that it's important to sort of recognize is that when you do these open label studies, there's a very high proportion of what we call placebo effect. So that's where you want a result to be right. Okay. So, and we know from pain studies and a lot of other sort of mental health studies for anxiety that up to 25 to 30% change or people will report a change if they're on a placebo. And they even did it with pain studies with paracetamol versus sugar tablets. And in fact, 35% of people felt better with the sugar tablets as opposed to paracetamol. So you have to really move from that open label trial to what we call a randomized control trial. You often need quite complex statistics. And it's really important, I think, that this is discussed with families beforehand that in clinical trials, we really need people to report it exactly as they see it. Because if you start to want to report it as people, as you think people might want to hear, it becomes really tricky in teasing out the true effect. But it's also the reason that researchers are often chasing additional markers such as EEG, blood tests and things that aren't susceptible to those answers. So we moved then to a connect FX, which was a double blind, which means that neither the patient, the family or the researchers knew whether people were on a placebo, so a, essentially a, a, a gel without the product versus a gel with the product. And it was randomised, which essentially means you have an equal chance of getting the gel with the product versus the gel without a product. And one lot had placebo and one didn't. And we did this study, um, got through, met the numbers. We were looking for safety and efficacy. But when you do these studies, you have to have what we call a primary endpoint. And given the effects we've seen in that early study, um, Zinova had felt that social avoidance was the thing that we were really looking for in terms of that sort of anxiety um, measure. And so what we did was look at that as the primary outcome. And so that was in um, people with full scale, or full mutations. We got 212 patients internationally with a mean age of 9.47 years. So roughly the same. And again, three quarters male in that product. So what we found and where the Connect FSX um, trial had problems was that when we looked at whether it, the change in social avoidance was significantly different between product and placebo, in the whole group with full mutation, it didn't reach significance. However, when we went back and did a sub-analysis with those patients, 169 of them that had full mutation, but also had greater than 90% methylation. So that's where you're producing much less FMRP. And so 90 to 100% methylation. So the more severe group, because this is the group that often have the more severe phenotype and produce much lower levels of FMRP. We did see significant results. And so what we found were significant results in social avoidance, the caregiver, global impression, the change in social isolation, irritability and disruptive behaviours, 
and social interactions, which was really important because what we've then identified in is that with much lower levels of FMRP, it's probably having more of an impact on that synaptic um, chaos um, without the regulation of the 2AG and the anandamide and causing more problems. We also found that safety um, was pretty good, really. The only thing that was really different between the CBD gel and the placebo gel was some a sort of sight pain where the gel was rubbed on the shoulders. And that's more common in kids that have really dry skin. There's a little bit of stinging goes on. So just looking at those results, when we looked at the whole population, the 212, what we found was some reduction, so slightly better in the guys that got the um, ZYN, ZO2 in social avoidance, slightly better in irritability and slightly better, but none of these reach significance. So then if you look at the group that had nine, greater than 90% methylation, we started to get a small amount of difference between the social avoidance scale in particular. Normally 0.05 is where we think that's significant. So this is where we're starting to see change here. And I've put this slide in just to show you that there's often a lot of variation. So this is using the... Um, changes from baseline to week 12 in that. And you can see that the mean change for the product is better than the placebo that has no mean change. So it does sort of improve, but there's still people who got the product who got worse, and there are still people who didn't get the product who got better. So it's, it's a little bit unclear there. If we then go and look at the changes in the ABC in the methylation group, what we see is these changes, which is fairly similar to what I was talking about before. So if you have a change that's greater than three, so this is looking at responders. So for social avoidance, nearly 60% were responders. Um, but we had 40% that were responders to um, the placebo as well. So there are changes, but they weren't hugely significant, more significant in the greater than 90% methylated group. And likewise here, one of the biggest improvements we felt we saw was in the social interactions um, in this group here. So, um, that has really, they went back to the FDA then, and I'll fill you in in a minute. But importantly, the we looked at the side effects, and most of them were very mild and very manageable, um, with almost as many side effects in the placebo group as there were in the other groups. So nothing that was really too significant apart from that skin pain. So when we look at clinical trials, we go through that preclinical, often animal phase. We do that phase one where we look at the safety and efficacy. So that first study we did was phase one, phase two, and then we do the phase three. And at that stage, we go back and talk to, well, the drug companies do, go back and talk to the FDA. The FDA required when they saw those results, they weren't happy to accept, accept the, um, the sub-analysis that we did after the original trial was there. And so they requested that actually we they redid the trial, but actually with a primary endpoint of looking at the full mutation, not of uh, the full methylation rather than the partly methylated group. So that has led us to the reconnect. FX study, which is currently going on in four sites around Australia. So Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, and Adelaide. And at this point where they're looking for 200 patients with fragile X syndrome, around 160 of those with complete methylation, which is, should be where we would get to. They've adjusted the dose a little bit um, to give slightly higher doses for bigger kids. Um, and they've 
anchored and adjusted the measurement of the CGI based on the core symptoms of Fragile X, so social avoidance, isolation, social interactions and irritability, which was where we found the biggest impact in those previous studies. So they're using the previous studies to try and get maximum impact there. They're also looking at slightly longer trials, so 18 weeks versus 14 weeks in the Connect, and looking at trial visits both on-site and face-to-face to try and minimise that burden. So we screen patients three years to 17-year-olds, then they get randomised to either treatment or not. And then once you've gone through this bit of the trial, then you're eligible for the open label trial if you've had a response. So there are some criteria to enter into that. The primary endpoint for this one is around the social avoidance subscale. Um, in the complete methylation, which is different to the Connect FX. So really looking at the completely methylated group and secondary analysis being the social avoidance in the full population. So that is the website um, if people are interested in joining that in Australia. And that's the key phone number for people to ring. Um, If you link to that website, there is actually a form that you can fill on that will be sent through to the sites um, to then contact people if they're interested in it.